Welcome to the Alapa Podcast, the home for cultural chit chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. to a very special edition of the Elaborate Podcast. <laughs> Joining me right here in the building, right next to me, albeit at a socially responsible social distance of two meters, is Mary. So gone uh, are the Skype podcasts, the posh part of Madrid. You know, we can actually move around. We saw each other for the first time in like three months, two weeks ago, and now we're finally doing a podcast like the old times, back before the event. Uh, we were right next to each other. Well, the two, mis- two meter distance, of course. Um, so, Mary, welcome back to the podcast as it used to be. How are you feeling? Thank you. I'm very excited. Yeah. This is much better. Back in the studio, exactly. So, um, it was a nightmare. Well, Skype is a great <laughs> resource, but uh, Skype, you know, trying to get the, the video off Skype and then editing it. And then mm. the sound is not perfect, you know. So, uh, those days are gone. And uh, we're going to talk about the new brilliant days where we're in phase two in Madrid and the rest of the country is in phase three. Uh, but we're passing to phase three probably next week, uh, which means we can move around uh, the country, which will be relevant, um, you know, next in the next part of the podcast or maybe even this one when we talk about it. So we can kind of move around and do some more projects maybe in mm. different parts of the country. Um, but, you know, we'll get to that. Um and in part two, we're going to talk about going to the Prado and going through the protocols and things like that. So this podcast is going to be cultural, but also a, uh, an explanation on the de-escalation, unintentional rhyming there. But uh, how you can start doing these things, like going to the museum and moving around the city um, with the new normal, to quote Pedro Sanchez. So we'll be kind of exploring those two things in this podcast, but... Mary, what are your thoughts? We're phase two, almost at phase three. We're actually sitting in the same room now at the moment. Um, so, I don't know, hit me with your opinion stick. Mm, it's just nice to be back to normal, or at least partially normal. So, I don't know. We have these moments where things, like, obviously we haven't recovered our ordinary lives because there's a lot of things that... Um, are still not like they used to be and um, we still have to be careful <clears throat> with elderly people and so on but it's just really really nice to and well I appreciated it before very much so so now it's like a, it's the same <laughs> no, and this is actually great because we're at the apex of like appreciating each other and within two weeks, you're going to be taking me for granted again. So this is the, this is the moment where... Again, he says... I'm only joking, of course. But um, yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I was, I, I'm, I'm playing battle again. Uh, not that significant. But uh, mm. one of the English lads was telling me he flew back from England uh, like a week or two weeks ago, which I was surprised about because uh, if you listen to our last episode of the podcast, we said we were interviewed on Spain Speaks and one of his updates, serious updates, was that uh, Spain says yes to Germans but no to British travellers. So I was under the impression that flying from the UK was actually prohibited at the moment. Do you know anything about that? Well, um, flying from anywhere was banned unless there was like, um, you know, very important reason or you've been seeing posts about uh, flights to Ireland and so on out of need so it was the same but I think this was more referring to like the tourist season because obviously like British and Germans are um, probably the two nationalities that we get the most of during the summer here and certainly well in Spain from the 15th of June is like summer season already so we're virtually entering that and normally there would be like hordes of them coming over yeah. <laughs> at the moment but now it's going to be uh, slightly slower well 
The flights from Germany started today to the Balearic Islands. So we'll see how that goes. They were saying that they're taking people's temperatures, but they're not really testing them, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, um, so he was also saying that he had to wear the mask on the whole flight over, which is annoying. And then he uh, had some problem with his passport, but he got through that. And then he was dancing because he was in Spain, and because it was so hot, he started sweating. And then he turned a corner, and there's like loads of police officers, and he had to check his temperature. And like he said, he literally looked like he had the virus because he was sweating and like nervous. And so, um, <laughs> and now, uh, I mean, he got he got through it, but it gives an indication of, of kind of what uh, it is to do these things right now. Um, you had an experience yourself. What with temperature? Had a health resist, didn't you? Uh, I did, yeah. So I kind of went mad there uh, a couple of weeks ago, where I decided to cut my own hair. Again, the first time it worked really well. The second time, um, the machine didn't really work. I put the head on the razor, but for some reason it acted. I'm sure it was the machine. And it acted as a zero. And then I went to um, the hairdressers and then they took my temperature. And because it was hot and I'm Irish, you know, I, I just slightly <laughs> raised temperature. And they were like, oh, we'll check it again. And they did. And it was like still kind of hot, but not really hot. But they're like, ah, we'll just do it anyway. And they did. Uh, and they cut my hair and they tried to fix what I did to myself and now it's growing out so I'm yeah. happy with that um, and when we talk about the prior and part two it'll be more temperature checking okay yeah um, thermometers uh, galore no um, so yeah so and then um, we mentioned that we uh, I think I'm not sure if we mentioned the last episode but you know the book for example has been uh, on a list of banned books no it's been on the list in Marshall <laughs> Bonds um, yeah Goose Stepping Guys and Black Burning It but no um, it's a kind of famous bookshop here and it was one of the first books to actually stock or bookshops to actually stock our book mm. and they compiled a list of kind of must read books about the coronavirus and fake news and around that and on their virtual um, window mm -hmm, you know yeah. and um, yeah our, our book was on that which is which is quite a nice honour as well but also interesting that they had a virtual window because you can't really go out or you couldn't go out and kind of take a, a glance at different bookshops and and you know have a sconce as they say in Ireland uh, but now you, you can but but back then you couldn't so they had to uh, improvise with that um, but we mentioned uh, something very interesting um, that we can go outside the city from next week onwards, which should be very relevant for us because we're working on a project and we're not going to reveal too much about it right now, but involves the cinema, your wonderful mother, <laughs> Marisa, uh, who I'm a big fan of, I have to say, and uh, her memories of your of her grandfather, your grandfather's cinema in Abu no. Her grandfather. Her grandfather. Said, My great grandfather. Um, I thought you meant great, isn't he? Was like just a legend. But yeah. You actually mean. I've always been really excited. I uh, <laughs> see. You're not appreciating me anymore. It's already started. <laughs> but um, so it's kind of. I'm. We're doing it together, obviously. But this was your brainchild. Um, and obviously, we're not going to reveal too many details about it. But you have been doing a lot of detective work, and you found things related to Bunuel. The Civil War, uh, distributors in Grand Via, um, uh, kind of like sneaking in and watching movies. Uh, so what do you care to share with us about this? I think you've already shared everything we want to share at this stage. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, one of these individual stories that fit within a bigger narrative of something that is not talked about uh, quite as much in Spain. So I think it'd be really nice to, to be able to do that. Yeah, and it's just a nice kind of uh, bringing together of a personal recollection and kind of these four memories of a, of a family and then kind of link it to something bigger, which would be the cinematic history of, of, of Spain. And uh, what's interesting is like the fortunes of that cinema um, seem to mirror the cinema, the Cinedore, which is in our tour, where in the 20s and 30s is very artistic. And uh, in the later decades, it's kind of a move towards more mass entertainment but we'll park it there anyway and we'll come back to it once it's done and it's garlanded with Oscars and Goyes and all those kind of awards but uh, we're also working on another project uh, which we can't reveal too much about either um, but it's interesting it involves uh, a poet coming to Madrid and maybe stories 
around that so we have high hopes for that as well and uh, I'm back I'm back on the ghost writing <laughs> ebook wagon and wagon another thing that we cannot <laughs> talk about uh, well I can because it's my project so I will kind of like flout the rules a little bit there but um, wagon's an interesting term because it's about the Dalton gang I never heard of them have you ever heard of these guys oh of course you have so tell me yeah what you know about them Lucky look. Yeah, uh, lucky look, lucky yes. Luke. Yeah, um, I've never seen that, but I've heard the character. They they appear in that and Huckleberry Hounds. I can say it purely in Spanish, like we used to lucky look. <laughs> well, um, it's it's mad because I, I think I told you that like you two, uh, when they're touring the Joshua Tree in 1987, dressed up as the Dalton Gang or the Dalton Brothers, this kind of like country and western spoof bands, and they were their own warm up act. Uh, in different stadiums and it was all like an in-joke because Bono had met Hank Williams and he was like you can make more money doing country and western than you can with rock and roll with a few more expletives thrown into his his uh, his advice and so they came out like dressed in a certain way and talking with a southern drawl and, and going yeah and all that and uh, no like if you're in the front row of some of those concerts you, you did realise but a lot of people didn't and even to this day it's kind of been lost in the ether as a story you know so it's kind of like a bit mad but um as always it's been a fascinating uh book because it's not just about the gang exploits but also about um the role of women in kind of western uh, literature and cinema and society but also the kind of role of the cowboy uh, different cultural forms through which the Daltons have appeared like looky luke um, so with, with many things you can always extrapolate a bigger and far richer story uh, from that as well so well, anyway, that's all just the main course, or the starter to the main course. But um, uh, we can talk about uh, some more short films from Lebanon in the second part. And then the main course of the main course, uh, going to the Prado and going through the coronavirus protocol. So it's back, baby. The part one, part two, and part three, it's back. We're back like before. And now it's time for the interlude. <laughs> two of the show um, okay so let's get the docu- uh, not the documentaries the short films from Lebanon out of the way um, because we hated them which is very strange um, I'm not supposed to say that no yes okay I'm supposed to measure my opinion it's now. a bit strong um, we won't put it in the title that, no I mean I value the people who made it as human beings <laughs> but it wasn't to my taste if that's better okay uh, um, I think we we're unlucky to, to go onto that website where they have all these Arabic movies and documentaries and we've discussed the ones we've seen before and liked um, and it was like some kind of sci-fi week mm-hmm. where uh, it was all kind of like um, based on, on sci-fi themes uh, so we watched one about a guy who was a Neanderthal no, he's just an early human in the Stone Age period and he goes through this um, uh kind of mystical journey and learns how to use fire and create art, art culture basically I think it's the birth of culture is the idea <laughs> uh, then there's one uh, about this kind of tower block where all of Palestine fits into this tower block and that had an interesting premise um, but maybe wasn't as good and then um, the story of a woman uh, who and this was in, I mean it was technically very well done this one in particular uh, but her, she gets news that her husband's coming back after he's disappeared and was missing. And it, it turns into some kind of weird psychological thing and then ends very abruptly with like an important message. So those are the three that, uh, films in in, um, in summary. I mean, for you, what, what are the standout details from one of them or one that you connected with maybe the most? Or I can start if you wish. I think the... Since you've asked me... I think the um, the one with the early human in the Stone Age, as you described it. Um, what is he? 
He, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's undefined, but let's not get into the technicalities of prehistory. No, no, but I mean, I want to put this on record. Like, I've discovered that Chilean mummies are actually older than Egyptian mummies, and you are an Egyptologist. But yes, I'm not traumatized by that, you know, like... No, but I'm just saying, like, if you're... How can I take you seriously when it comes to archaeology and prehistory <laughs> when you're studying the wrong mummies, you know? The wrong mummies, <laughs> like this, right, the wrong mummies. Um, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, back to the Neanderthal Great. slash early human slash Stone Age person. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the one that uh, I don't know if I liked it best because I really didn't like the other two, and this was the third one we watched, so it was like actually it is better. But technically, I thought it was a lot more serious, you know, less like um, amateurish. Um, and it was interesting. I didn't immediately did that association of like discovering um, art like you did. Um, but it had some interesting elements. I don't think it's something you can describe. I mean, it's such a like, short movie. I think you should have a... You should look. <laughs> and just feel. It's like a mood piece. You should watch it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, it had a, a problem, though. Of, I, call it, I like to call it the clean feet problem. Where his feet were just immaculate and not dirty. You know? Okay, yes, I was making little <laughs> comments all the time because because his eyebrows were like plucked perfectly and he's meant to like be living in prehistory in a cave and he hasn't even discovered fire, which he does during the movie, but his eyebrows are like perfectly plucked and he's got clean feet, so I just couldn't help myself. Uh, Historical accuracy. You couldn't help you know? yourself because he was just this Neanderthal. Uh, what's the words? Man, sexual, kind of like. Perfect, I don't know where you're going. Perfectly groomed, uh, like a Stone Age David Beckham. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, whenever I see, he look more like Mo Salah. But when, yeah. <laughs> whenever, like, you see something like that, or a historical movie, or prehistorical movie, you know, if you're in the tray, you just can't help pointing out details that are not accurate. What can I do? Okay, with the detail of Chilean mummies being older. No, that's a fact. Yeah. But you never thought it was important. Did, that wasn't in the documentary. <laughs> We're talking about the documentary. They always are back. He's just asking me about this and I'm not related to what we're talking about. Uh, fair enough. Um, I think, um, I guess the short documentary or film, they're just trying to create a mood uh, rather than a triac structure. Even though, I mean, it is possible to have a triac structure in a 10-minute piece. Um, but I just think, yeah, it's just showing something that's not normally filmed and uh, just exploring whatever it is you get out of it and uh, just kind of being in, in the mood uh, of that. And again, technically very well done, um, especially the kind of psychedelic scenes where he's undergoing some brain revolution and suddenly he's awakened to the culture. Or not, depending on your point of view. Um, now, I think... Um, yeah, and then the other two... Um, I just think like sometimes with short films, they just kind of go for either just very exaggerated shock or melodrama um, or something that's just... Like, doesn't make any sense. It's like, sci- it's like sci-fi or whatever. But, um, like, the, the Palestinian thing is interesting because it is about land and, and living rights and, and where you can live and, and then putting all the Palestinian people into this humongous um, you know uh, tower block is kind of symbolic in a sense but you know language like film is a visual medium I, I think you know you can watch most films without the sound and get the story you know um, but I think this either we were visually illiterate for this particular story or the visual language was confused. I don't know which one it was, but there's just a lot of like kind of references that seemed either kind of cheap or tacked on. And, you know, for example, the, the film ends with a pregnant woman kind of patting her belly and looking out over, you know, the, the walls of Israel, for example. And, okay, you know that the Palestinian conflict is defined by that relationship, but you're not, I just don't know what the film was trying to say, basically, you know. Um, I think, you know, in the Stone Age um, film, 
it's open to interpretation and that's because it's very well made and you can maybe look at it through different lenses but with this one it just seems like I just don't know what's going on really and maybe that's my fault or not my fault but I'm just you know not in the milieu or I'm not um, versed in, in, in the imagery maybe of that particular story but, but for me it just seemed like that there's just no coherency to that particular story yeah, I would agree. I don't I don't understand it. I thought the concept was very promising and the whole idea of creating this tower for Palestinian people and yeah, obviously there's a social commentary to be made there, but the actual execution um was confusing because in the end it was like is this meant to be like a more progressive way of life than than the heart because she looks out of the window and she sees Israel and then when he zooms out you can see that this is just a tower where all the Palestinians are and they're kept safe but at the same time they're isolated to the point that she has like the one olive tree in the middle of the living room that she waters um, and it's all kind of like futuristic but it's sort of like the social message gets lost in my opinion Okay, and then the other one, again, it's an interesting premise. Um, so, as we said, a woman's husband comes back. And like, I think, again, it's a fantastic premise because I think there's probably a lot of disruption to to that event where someone disappears. That's traumatic. Um, and then you kind of learn, maybe not, maybe not learn to live without them, but you kind of adjust and you still miss them and your heart is broken and you want to see them. But then you get the news that they're coming back and it's a miracle. But also, probably, there's just a feeling like, how does my life readapt to how it was before or kind of absorb this, this, this person again? Will I feel the same? Will they be the same? Will things be different? Can we pick things up like they were, you know? Um, maybe that's not true for some people, but for this character, it was. And I think that's a plausible premise. But um, I just think it ascends into kind of like... Uh, almost like jump scares and just kind of jingle jangly kind of like sound design which is very good very well executed but just to kind of indicate great tension and um you know that kind of thing and she ends up um you know there's a picture on the wall of him hugging her and um you can't see her um but you can see him so it's just the back of her head and then she ends up uh shooting him for some reason and then the, the 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 ending kind of shot is a reverse of that picture, um, and again I just feel like this is an interesting premise, but they just didn't know how to maybe tell that story in a dramatic way. I mean, not dramatic, but in a kind of just bring that premise to its logical conclusion, or just to, to tease it out. And they went down maybe the easy route of just kind of like this is this this heightened, super real kind of horror. And and then again, this kind of confused symbolism at the end, maybe, or maybe I just didn't get the symbolism at the end of the reversal of the image. But um, you know, that was my interpretation of uh, that particular movie as well. I think it had a very valuable message, like you said, right at the end about people that had disappeared and so on, and the whole idea of you know, it's something that it doesn't get talked about a lot, I guess, but the whole idea of how the person feels that has stayed here and then the other person comes back and they're just nervous, like, will they be the same person? And especially because they've changed and probably the other person expects things to be the same as before they were taken. Um, So all that is very interesting, but then it kind of like, yeah, it's got like that horror vibe where she's like chopping food and stuff. and, um, And yeah, that's all good, but then... I don't know, it's sort of like not very clear, the conclusion, like you said, like she ends up shooting him and you're not really quite sure why, or at least we didn't really figure it out, so... Yeah, I mean, I think... It's a shame, because... Yeah, I mean, there's potential there, but it's just very interesting because uh, obviously disappearances and that concept is a huge thing because we watched a documentary about the photographer who is trying to reclaim disappeared people um, through all these different techniques. And we discussed that in, I think, the second coronavirus Mm -hmm. quarantine special podcast. Um, And um, so, yeah, so it's a very compelling uh, story that that can be told with with those historical details. But 
Um, I think an opportunity missed in in two of those stories, and then the Stone Age one was was decent. So yeah, I mean, I watched Scarface and I liked it. I, I could we could have spoken about that, you know, that was a good movie. But uh, Scarface, <laughs> oh, flash from the past. Well, uh, I know, right? Um, but it's not like it's. Oh, actually, that reminds me. I must talk to you about Orson Welles once we're done and dusted. Uh, with this podcast um but um yeah so that's um too interesting to share on the podcast but anyway we'll talk about going to the prado and that process of entering this building so uh mary uh you, again you invited me you, you booked the tickets you found out about the story what is happening in the prado right now yes you are amazing <laughs> i acknowledge that um Basically, they announced that uh, El Prado was going to open again, but since they still had to keep like social distancing and something that was manageable, they decided to put the kind of like most famous um, 200 paintings in the same area. So they put them all together. A bit like in the old-fashioned way in the museums where they just, or art galleries where they just put all the you know, all the frames together, one above each other. And, um, and yeah, we didn't know what to expect because um, they named this the comeback or, you know, meeting again, meeting, meeting up again. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, yeah, we were just, well... It was like probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to see all these works of art all together. And you were right at the end with a practical observation, which is that when you go to El Prado, you don't have time to see it all. Like it's a lot of hours you should spend there. And in the end, you end up sort of skipping through things. And perhaps this is like the lazy part of you know <laughs> of uh, this initiative, but. Um, but I think from the perspective of the fact that it gives you a good glimpse of the main um, artistic areas uh, that the museum covers or artists, famous artists that the museum covers, I think that's, um, yeah, it was really interesting. It wasn't actually as small as we thought it was going to be. Um, there was more open than, than we thought. Um yeah, and then overall the experience wasn't too bad. I don't know what you found it like. This was the first thing we were actually doing outside uh, the house. Um, yeah, I don't know how did you find it in terms of um, getting in and all the measures. Well, um, yeah, it was pretty straightforward. It was a cold day, so my temperature wasn't through the roof. And uh, yeah, I mean, you just had your mask on, they took your temperature, they scanned your stuff like normal um people there's a certain there's only a certain number of people allowed into the forum so um you had enough space um and people were kind of responsible enough so to be honest with you I, you know I, I don't think it was that disruptive or that you would really notice it that you're going to the museum in the new normal you know um like you had to go into one entrance and exit another so there's like practically things you have to do but it's not something that's ever present, you know, where you realize that you're in a strange situation. So, uh, yeah, overall, quite comfortable, you know. Hmm. I think from that point of view, it was better than I thought. And then, well, there was a nice element, I guess, to the the whole, like, welcome back type thing. It, it, it kind of felt that the museum knows like, what a symbol of the, of the city they are and, like, how they're world renowned so you know they they had to um they wanted to do something to to welcome people back into the museum including tourists because there were some tourists when we were there um so yeah all in all i think it was um quite a nice experience and the ticket was half the price because it was meant to be to celebrate the fact that we were coming back although i think it's also to do with the fact that you don't see anyone here as many paintings as normal as you would normally so rather than 16 euros 8 euros and yeah but they're still doing like the two free hours at the end of the day and so on so 
So it, it, I think it was a nice way to to go back to to doing what we usually do, which is going to exhibitions and going to to museums. Um, well, we should say, you know, as well that um, like there were some alterations, like the Velasquez, Las Meninas, all the 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 people in that picture were wearing masks, you know, that had been superimposed onto the canvas. Is this Twitter based? <laughs> What's that? Is this uh, Twitter based? No, it's not. No, uh, that obviously wasn't the case. But Las Meninas were there. A lot of Velasquez, Velasquez, uh, Goya. Uh, El Greco or at least one of his uh, Paul Rubens for example and uh, yeah so a best of collection of the most amazing uh, paintings and it could be interesting because I read you know that um, even though it's emblematic and uh, of, of Spanish art and, and the treasure trove of paintings in the city it's not as visited as other museums around the world um, so this could be a way to uh, kickstart it once we go back to the actual normal rather than the new normal and uh, people can maybe visit it more but it's a nice detail that uh, the culture is being reawakened after the quarantine um, now um, the, predominantly we saw uh, Goya and Rubens they seem to be heavily represented there now we have a kind of a differing view on uh, Francisco Goya the Goya uh, mm-hmm. FG as I like to call him uh, you're not that much of a fan are you? no well that's a really bad thing to say on a <laughs> podcast no no I don't think well it's the same as many artists obviously there's a difference between you appreciating what they do and their significance in Spanish art history in general and they being like one of your favourite artists so that's for sure I quote and just going to get a piece of paper here a useless waste of space, end quote. Ah, um, that's a total <laughs> lie. Yeah. Um, no, not at all. I mean, you know, there are obviously... To be honest, the thing that I find uh, most interesting about Goya is more like all the part of like the, the, all the dark um, and paintings, everything about the disasters and all that. Uh, kind of like pessimistic, um, you know, collection of uh, of paintings to do with like politics, society, and so on, superstition and uh, religion, and yeah, I find that uh, quite interesting. Obviously, there are all the paintings like you know, um, third the third of May. Um, I don't know what it's called in English. Shootings of the third no, of May. No, third of May, yeah. Just third of May. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's a, a, an important like part of history that in a, in a very famous uh, and then uh, painting and then he's got other scenes, uh, you know, even of like uh, leisure or like um, the bourgeoisie playing games and being like outdoors and things like that and of course all to do with like the king and the court and so yeah of course it's like one of our like Spanish um, Spain's most renowned painters um, yeah probably um, I, I, I don't know there are other styles that I prefer better or... uh, is it are you heard a rumor that when people ask you what Goya tourists or whatever you tell them that he's Portuguese not Spanish. What are you talking about? That you try to zone him nationally, you personally. Well, of course not, because like there's an issue here with Zaragoza, and I mean, you know, <laughs> you should know better that <laughs> my links to a part of the country are too, too large to... To ignore. To ignore. Um, now, uh, Seamus Heaney, the great Irish poet, and you wrote a very popular blog article about him. Did I know? You did, uh, irishsliceofmadrid.com. And uh, he came to it for a month and lived in La FPS and he was writing a collection of poetry. And he walked around the Prado and stumbled across uh, two, at least two Goya paintings. One was um, the 3rd of May and he was kind of blown away by it. And uh, I guess also because at the time uh, things in Northern Ireland were starting to kick off and maybe he saw a correlation between... Uh, those two different uh, uh, episodes separated by space and time and also in his poem um, about Madrid uh, he talks about Saturn 
and uh, that painting was also in that collection where Greco was representing Saturn and I um, know the monster was Saturn the monster or yes yeah, Saturn by Goya no Greco I said Goya did I say Greco yes <laughs> uh, well I meant Goya and uh, yeah so Saturn is eating his kids because he's like worried about losing power t- to one of his sons when they grow older which also can be related to Scarface but um, and also that reference uh, is in the poem as well so there's uh, I mean yeah, it's all related <laughs> uh, you know, it's all there um, no, it's just a fascinating museum because you obviously have the, the culture of the paintings themselves but also the people have gone in there and interacted with them um, now I love the 3rd of May uh, in particular I think it is a fantastic uh, painting um, we were discussing this as well I've, I've heard some people saying that the bodies are not that natural uh, like the human forms are not maybe as naturalistic I don't really agree so much but you're you're kind of saying that um that the, the forms are it's a kind of stylistic choice uh and that also brought us to another discussion in the Prado I mean obviously these paintings are very familiar to you because uh, you've studied them in school and also in Spain if you're not aware like you do learn I think it's obligatory to learn history of art before you can kind of choose it as a as a, an elective subject for your your leaving exams the bachillerato mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of people have a grounding in art so I mean I guess the impact on, of, of some of these images is maybe diminished slightly because you've been because you're so familiar with them no? Well I think it could be seen in, in two ways I think um, yeah I was saying that to you about Las Meninas because it's been over explained and overdone for me but many others I think it's the opposite because like uh, when you see, for example, some of Velázquez paintings, because you've studied them so much, then you know, and they're so significant culturally for for Spain, then when you when you're in front of them, you're like, wow, that's that's quite impressive. Okay, very good. And uh, now we've established, uh, you know, the whole Goya thing. But uh, in terms of style and aesthetic, um, is there a Spanish artist or an artist that's featured in the Prado that you're quite fond of? Uh, <laughs> that's quite a complicated question, a Spanish one. Uh, well, actually, no, there is a, wasn't there a Scottish guy who painted the kind of uh, naturalistic scenes? You pointed out, I love that painting. Oh, uh, David Roberts. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um... Yeah, I believe he was Scottish. Um, he basically did a lot of uh, very famous paintings of Egyptian archaeological remains. So I've got a, it's probably one of the um, first like art books that I that I got was like a really um, thick one of his touching ones of like David Roberts um, watercolors. Um, so actually seeing that particular one that was in Spain was quite interesting too I believe that was, your to- was what you were talking about I think there was also a Turner there uh, uh, which uh, I kind of like very much too yeah I love Turner but I didn't see a Turner there yeah and maybe you didn't turn towards the right one I'm going to ignore that yeah okay forget that uh, and pretty sure it was there yeah yeah. If you're if you're so sure about it, why are you talking <laughs> so softly now? <laughs> In the opposite voice that indicates confidence. But no, yeah. um, also uh, it's a product. So lots of pictures of the baby Jesus and and a, and a great one of like a, a, a kid Jesus in the temple uh, debating with all the doctors. Oh, yeah, you know, do you like that one? Yeah, teenage Jesus. Yeah, it was great because he was like, no, your appendix is not important actually, you know, and things like that. Um, and they captured the, I don't know, um, I don't know what they captured. It's a mad scene. But uh, and there's another. Well, it's a very famous episode of the Bible. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but then there's another uh, one of Jesus as well, where he's um, receiving the Magi, and it's a huge uh, painting, the Three Wise Men, and. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, <laughs> he, the bit the, he's very tiny compared to the rest of them as well. So I think uh, you overheard some American lady commenting on that, didn't you? Um, yeah, I guess he was the very small baby. Yeah, very small baby. It was a very tiny baby in comparison to all the other figures. But the baby Jesus that I like the most is the one with the beard. Yeah, why? 
Well, that's quite a cute picture. It's a very, it's a famous um, uh, artist as well. It's called Murillo in Spain. And it's quite nice because at that time it was quite um, kind of like down to earth human portrayal of Jesus as a kid uh, playing with a little bird and a dog as well. And, you know, it's like a family scene and it's all kind of like very sweet and very human, which is it sort of like departs from or the portrayal, very serious portrayals of Jesus. Yes, it's true, because I know Caravaggio um, painted Mary Magdalene and, and when she heard the news of Jesus being killed. Um, and that's not in the Prado, that particular painting, but that was shocking because she was painting such a human style, like an everyday kind of style, rather than something biblical. Um, so I wonder if, if that particular painting that you mentioned had such a um, dramatic effect as well, because it is a quite familial scene, and uh, definitely, um, you know, not something that uh, kind, of, kind of conforms to the, to the standard, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely doesn't conform because it's also based on like a, um, like a fake gospel, really, because um, those scenes of like baby Jesus playing with uh, birds and there's an episode in like a fake, one of the fake gospels that says that he's playing with mud and creates little birds and then they start flying. So... The representation of scenes like that from like what they are called like the fake gospels that are not including in the New Testament is was quite uh, new as well. And you're gonna make a joke about something. I'm what? not. <laughs> what now? No, no, I'm, I'm listening. It's not a joke. It's a question. Go it's on. It's not a question. Fire away. It's, not, it's neither actually. <laughs> okay, no, that's all I was going to say. So that that's a departure as well. You know, using an episode from that is not in the New Testament. Fair enough. And all I was going to say is, like, we can finish this part about the Prado, I guess, with Rubens. Um, now, there's a lot of Rubens there. Do you know much about Rubens? Not as much as you. I don't know anything about Rubens. <laughs> I tried to watch a documentary about it, and I got halfway through. And so I'll, uh, we'll leave you with this. Um, it's like Rubens has amplified the sound of his paintings with the darks, uh, the dark colours amplifying the sound of the screams and torturous paintings and elevating the size of his lovers in the softer paintings not my thoughts you're the trying thoughts. to quote from the going it's sort of documentary I just do that but you, you cut me off there <laughs> I think I was very obviously that's what I was doing I set it up that way and now it's going to elegantly come out of it again okay so that was the Prado and uh, yeah I think that's everything we have to say about it so we'll meet you uh, in part three of the show So here we are at part three. It was so interesting. Of the show. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll let you in on a little secret. Like before, we recorded part three before part two. So thank you for rumbling us again. <laughs> but uh, since you've, you've done that, uh, do you want to talk about where uh, people can find us? You can find us on Twitter at El Arpa One, Facebook, El Arpa Media, um, the podcast on a platform of which you're probably using already. <laughs> um, and our blog, irishliesofmadrid.com. Um, exactly. Um, and also don't forget to check out our website for our book, fakenewsbulos.es. That's dot .es. It is in Spanish, and uh, it's just dedicated to selling more copies of the book. So, you know, <laughs> naked ambition and greed there. Um, but thank you for tuning in to another exciting edition of the Alapra podcast and you know when we were interviewed on Madrid Metropolitan they asked us how frequent our podcast was or maybe with Spain Speaks uh, but we'll be back next week I'm sure with another exciting installment but until then uh, thank you very much and good luck and good night <laughs> good lucky Luke yeah <laughs> bye
The Alapa Podcast, the home for cultural chit-chat in and outside Madrid. People will talk. <laughs>